Good morning. Uh, I'm pretty excited about this webinar. Uh, we have three plant breeders from uh, MSU, Dr. Bruckner, who's a winter wheat breeder, um, Dr. Sherman, who I think is uh, malting barley, barley, is that correct? All barley. Yeah, and then Dr. McVie, who's doing pulse crops. And, uh, and so I'm excited to hear what they're doing and, uh, and looking forward to probably planting some of the varieties in the future. Uh, let's get this started. Thank you guys for joining us. Dr. Bruckner. Okay, well, my name's Phil Bruckner. I'm, uh, of course, the winter wheat breeder. I've been here for a number of years now, pushing uh, not quite 30, but uh, more than a quarter of a century anyway. So uh, what I'd like to do today is talk about things that you're interested in. We're in our research program, just in the transition period from finishing up harvest to uh, moving in to getting seed ready for this fall's nurseries. And uh, that's where we're at. And uh, just in terms of new varieties, this past year we have released a couple new varieties and those were Flathead. We licensed Stan Clear CLP to Nutrien and uh, of course we have a soft fly line bobcat that's uh, in the hands of the seed growers now and uh, we're looking forward to that getting into commercial production. So for our career we've worked for for you the farmers of Montana and uh, trying to address your needs. One thing that I will say that has changed over my time at MSU and time as a plant breeder is there's a lot more commercial companies interested in developing, uh, I think all varieties for Montana, but specifically I, I know um, for winter wheat varieties, there's a lot of uh, companies that are testing winter wheat varieties in Montana and uh, trying to develop those that work in the environment. So be happy to answer any questions or talk about any specific things that uh, you're interested in along the way. So. And if, if you have a question, just chat. You can use the chat box, put it, put your question in there and, and we'll make sure uh, that, that one of these uh, doctors answer the question for us. Thank you. I, I will just uh, mention as uh, as we transition, let me introduce Dr. Jamie Sherman, our, our barley breeder. Of course, she does do malt barley, but she does a lot of other things in barley also. I know forage barley and, and uh, edible barley, so she's aggressive. She's got a good program going, and uh, we're real happy to have her on our faculty here at uh, MSU. Well, thanks, Phil. I appreciate that. I, I think our success is due largely because um, all the plant breeders work together and really support each other. And I know both you and Kevin have helped, done different things to help me. So I really appreciate it. Um, so this last year, we released a new malt line called Buzz, named after Buzz Matlin, a farmer on the eastern side of the state. Um, it's a daughter of Hockett that has a gene that makes it have lower protein than, than most malt barley lines and under almost all uh, agronomic conditions. So if you put down a little bit too much fertilizer than the rain you get, or if you don't get the rain in a timely fashion, buzz will still have lower protein. It has very stable plumps and yield like Hockett does. And it has something for the maltsters in that it, um, goes through the malt process faster, and so it can save them time and money as well. So we, we're excited about that uh, new release. This next year, we're hoping to release um, a spring forage line that will build upon uh, the good qualities of Lavina, 
but have higher biomass while maintaining the grain yield. Um, and we hope that it is also uh, a little bit more digestible for the cattle and um, it stands a little bit taller than the vina. So we're hoping that it does well across the state. We're about a year behind that, uh, being able to release a food barley. Probably our first release will be a white hollis barley which we've heard that the Japanese are interested in, including in um, a supplement in their rice. Um, and, but we also have a purple barley, uh, hollis barley in the works. And then finally, I'd just like to mention our attempts to uh, develop a winter barley. Uh, we have started our winter breeding program by incorporating some cold tolerant material from, from Russia. And um, we've also been working with other barley breeders around the country who've, who've given us germplasm. And so we're working on that. We think probably the first thing we'll be able to release will be a winter forage, uh, but we have, uh, we're working on all aspects of, of the winter barley as well. So those are the primary things. We also have some research projects. And if you have questions that we don't have time to get to, uh, we actually spent quite a bit of time putting together some uh, videos. All the graduate students in my program put together some videos and uh, my lab manager, Hannah Turner, helped us get all those put together. So, so go to our website, um, and it's barley breeding on, at the Montana website and, and take a gander at those and um, hopefully that'll fill in any of the blanks that we're not gonna get to today. Okay, so I guess I could hand it off to Kevin. So Kevin hasn't been with uh, MSU very long, but he's a long-term pulse breeder. Um, his most recent uh, position was in North Dakota, but he's been with us, I guess, a couple of years or maybe even three. Time goes by so fast, Kevin. But anyway, it's exciting to hear what all he's working on. A lot of different species. While, you know, I only work on one species, uh, Kevin has to deal with a couple of or three or four different species. So what do you got to say, Kevin? Well, thanks, Jamie. I, I'm going to interject here for a moment. And I know there was a chat question that came in. I don't know if, if Walter, if you want her to, uh, to address that now or if you want to get to those later. Yeah, why don't we just go ahead and everyone introduce themselves and then we'll come back with the questions because some of them kind of cross over on who. So people can just put them in as they wish. And Perfect. Okay. We'll come back at the end. Yeah. Well, yeah, thanks, Jamie. Uh, I, I've had a good time here at MSU. It's been three and a half years. Uh, uh, this is my fourth field season and it has been uh, a challenge as it always is to start a brand new program uh, so with the pulse crops uh, norm whedon had done some uh, initial uh, development of a specialty uh, p uh, prior to my uh, uh, coming to msu uh, but as far as a, a mainstream uh, breeding program uh, there was not one uh, here at msu so began from the very beginning uh, with very little. Uh, when I did the same thing at NDSU, as Jamie suggested, that's where I came from. Uh, the d department head there, I like what, what the way he termed it. When I arrived, I didn't even have a screwdriver to call my own. And that's a little bit of uh, the way I arrived here at MSU. Uh, the first year was hard and fast, trying to acquire germplasm, acquire equipment, uh, a lot of different things. Uh, I think we made some pretty good progress. Uh, since then, we've been making crosses, uh, developing the, the breeding program, uh, addressing, I guess, learning things about Montana, uh, things that we need to address as far as diseases and uh, environmental differences around the state. Uh, different research centers have helped with that. But we've got the pipeline uh, probably three quarters full uh, as far as a full set of, uh, of nurseries for the peas. Uh, lentils are uh, maybe one cycle behind that and the chickpeas uh, a cycle behind the lentils. So we're bringing each of those on as best we can and the, the, um, the lag or the difference maybe between the three is really quite reflective of the uh, ability or the, the challenges that there are making 
uh, but the physically making the crosses for each of those crops. Uh, peas is uh, a very easy. Mendel picked a great crop to work with to begin uh, understanding the genetics. Uh, lentils and uh, chickpeas, uh, due to the size and the sensitivity of the flowers, uh, much more difficult. Uh, as far as peas and where we're at, uh, I'm pretty happy this year uh, to have, uh, we've already harvested the first evaluation of uh, fixed lines in a large yield trial plot. Uh, it was unreplicated just because of the amount of seed, uh, but we had a chance to look at the first selections from the MSU program. Uh, seed quality, the way that they look, the way that they grew in the field agronomically, uh, quite pleased and impressed with those. Uh, so further years, uh, future years, we're going to be looking at those for uh, adaptation around the state uh, and in replicated trials to give us more confidence uh, in that data. Um, lentils, uh, I have a material there that is in head rows or single plant rows. Uh, so that's just one, one step behind where the peas are again. Uh, those will be harvested this week. And with the material that uh, I've looked at to this point, uh, the diversity of the market classes uh, between small reds, uh, petites, medium and, and large uh, versions of the small red lentil, uh, as well as the large medium uh, and small green lentils. Uh, I think there's some good material, uh, at least on appearance, um, to, to look at. Uh, so again, anxious, like this year for the peas, next year very anxious with the lentils to see uh, what they're going to look like. Uh, chickpeas, uh, we'll make our first selections next year uh, as, as pure lines. Uh, so things keep moving along, fill in the program, fill in the, uh, the pipeline of the, the breeding program. I hope to have, uh, at least for consideration, uh, a variety of, of, lent of peas uh, probably in two years, once we have some data to support that. So uh, still have to, um, to generate that data to, to feel confident in at least thinking about uh, one of those lines, but uh, things look good at this point. I'll just mention a little bit about the objectives that we're looking at, uh, obviously yield. Uh, we're looking at seed appearance. So size, shape, and color, the typical characteristics. Uh, one of the new things uh, that we're looking at for quality is what's inside the seed. There's a lot of interest in protein. How much is there? Uh, the quality of that protein is gonna come on uh, as kind of a second step. Uh, people are thinking, or the industry is beginning to think about what do those characteristics need to be? Uh, and through conversations I've had uh, they're developing the answers to those questions. They don't have them all at this point, actually. Uh, so once they learn, uh, we can uh, benefit from that. Uh, disease resistance, uh, working with pathologists around the state and even uh, for some virus resistance in Oregon, uh, evaluated a nursery there this year, uh, worked very well. Lots of different uh, pathogens uh, on each of the three crops uh, to, to consider there. So there's a lot of different things that go into the, the program and uh, pretty happy with where we are and uh, establishing a pulse crop breeding program for, for Montana and for MSU. So I'm gonna stop there and be happy to address any questions that uh, audience may have and uh, see where we go. So thank you. Well, I, I, I think you all can see the chat box and the first question on it, how long does it take to stabilize a seed variety before it will produce repetitive results. I, I bet that's a little different for each one of you. Go ahead, Jamie. <laughs> <laughs> well, we all go through it about the same way in our okay. crops is, is we do an inbreeding process to stabilize the genetics, but it does take a little bit longer with all of the winter crops. Um, just because we can't cycle through as many generations within a year, so, um, so for example, on average with the winter barley, I can only do two generations a year if I, you know, but with the spring, I can do three. So if I make a cross, I usually make my crosses in the fall with the spring material. And then I inbreed over that following year. And then it's ready to go out as um, single plants the next year. 
and then I select single plants and then the next year it's in rows. But after that, it should be relatively stable, not segregating. Um, so that's about how long it takes with the spring crop. The winter crops, again, take longer because we can't do as many generations per year. But there's, uh, Phil's been using some techniques to speed that process. Phil, why don't you talk about your double haploid stuff? Yeah, we do have more technology now that works fairly well in terms of uh, speeding the process. And we uh, do contract with a, a lab down in Kansas each year to, to develop double haploids from selected populations. It's kind of an expensive process. Um, each line that we get developed at this lab costs forty dollars and and if I'm going to look at the genetic uh, variability that could come from a, cr a new cross, a genetic combination of two parents, I want at least 100 lines. So for each one of those I send to that lab, it's going to cost me $4,000. So this is something I can only use for high priority or, or uh, specialty objectives. Most of my program is going to proceed at a more traditional pace. And, and in the field with winter wheat, that's really one generation per year. And uh, so normally it might take us, uh, I would select lines in the F7, which is the seventh generation after the cross. So that's seven years. But with this doubled haploid process and just real quick, we uh, send F1 seed from a unique combination of parents. They grow those, uh, those F1 plants. They uh, pollinate with a special corn pollen. And uh, this causes, uh, uh, there's different speeds of, of uh, chromosome movement during the cellular processes and the, the corn pollen is lost. So you end up with a, a, a haploid plant, which has only the wheat chromosomes, one set of the wheat chromosomes. And uh, during the process, you have to, that plant can't survive, it has to be rescued. So. So in the laboratory, they rescue the embryo and, uh, and save that plant. First, they uh, get the, the embryo culture to grow, and then they add the right hormones to uh, get some root growth. And then at some point, as, as that uh, tissue-cultured plant gets a little bigger, they're going to use a, a chemical called colchicine that that uh, disrupts the normal cellular uh, process. So, so you get a doubling of chromosomes. So, so if you go from a single set and you double and uh, you have a homozygous plant and uh, that process in the lab takes over a year. So, so uh, but compared to the seven years, if I send it in after the F1, and it comes back in a year and a half. I've saved two or three years or three or four years getting into a preliminary yield trial for high priority materials. So, so we're utilizing that in our program. We're limited by uh, how expensive it is. And, uh, but uh, we are using that routinely for high priority project, projects. I'll just mention briefly with the pulse crops, it's, it's actually very similar. Uh, all three of our crops are self-pollinated, so they, they kind of follow the same, uh, the same pathway uh, as far as the timeline to get to a pure line. Uh, as Phil mentioned, the, the seven years is, is ideal to ensure uh, a high level of, of purity or true breeding uh, performance. Uh, if you do the math, it takes seven years. I've only been here for three and a half or four field seasons. How do I already have pure lines that I'm evaluating in the field? And that's uh, using the, the greenhouse. Uh, I, the first year I did use a winter nursery 
Uh, those are expensive, so I haven't done that since. Uh, but uh, using the, that, that first year uh, off-season nursery as well as greenhouses since. Um, and then with the lentils, uh, I, I've gone a little bit earlier. Uh, I've gone at the F4, uh, selected F5 seed. Uh, and knowing that I would have to reselect within those, uh, I've still been able to get material that is uh, sufficiently true breeding uh, to be able to evaluate. And uh, knowing that I may have to make reselections uh, is just the, the sacrifice I've made uh, in order to accelerate the program uh, as fast as I could uh, to try and have material at the stage we're at uh, and be able to uh, evaluate them uh, for yield and other characteristics. So very similar. Well, thank you for that. I think uh, uh, I have a pretty good understanding now of why it takes so long to get us a good variety. Um, so there's a question here, is uh, any of the malting companies looking at Buzz for use in their products? So the good thing about Buzz is that it did pass AMBA approval and through that process then different companies looked at it and are, uh, were found it interesting, they want to test it. Um, so uh, New Belgium uh, Brewing Company in Colorado is interested in uh, using it in their process. And because of that, Malt Europe is growing it enough this year where they'll malt it and then New, New Belgium will brew with it. Um, uh, Anheuser-Busch grew it this summer. Um, I haven't heard the results of that, but they will, they just incorporate it into their regular trials and they always malt those trials. And so they'll run the same tests on it as, um, as they do their regular material. So hopefully they will like it um, as a replacement for Hocket because it does have some advantages with the low protein and its speed of going through the malting process. So it also doesn't lodge as badly as Hocket does. We did a fertility trial with it this year uh, that we've uh, actually done over several years. And Hocket lodges at higher water and higher fertility and and buzz just keeps standing up so we're happy about that too for the from the growers perspective um here's a question on is there a unique plant patent process for private versus public and then can farmers replant seed over multiple planting varieties so i'll start on that one i guess um a lot of what we have is a choice and a lot of it's a marketing choice that uh, a company might make on how they're going to market a variety in a certain place. And uh, of course they would like to sell producers seed every year if possible. And uh, there are some types of varieties that lend itself better to that. Of course, a F1 hybrid variety that would be used for corn is kind of the classic example that you buy hybrid seed every year from a certain company and uh, a farmer can't plant that back because besides a contractual agreement with whoever sold him the seed, there's the genetics. It won't be the hybrid the second generation. It'll change. It'll, the, gen, the genes will segregate in the next year and the performance will not be the same. With the self-pollinated crop, it's a little bit different though. And what we have is a lot of, uh, well, the classic example with wheat is the herbicide resistance, uh, both the clear field and the coaxium. There is technology owned by certain companies and uh, they control the market on, on those. And, and even if a public program is, is um, developing a herbicide resistant wheat, the technology is still owned by say BASF as for example for Clearfield. So there are restrictions. And as part of the stewardship agreement that growers use, they agreed to only use them one year and then you sell the grain and you have to buy new seed if you want to go back the next year. So and of course there's other varieties that 
commercial companies market that don't have maybe a patented trade in them or a, a uh, unique uh, genetic factor that that's contributes to the technology, but a company can require a CSO or, or a, a one, a one uh, use sale. That's one strategy and you, we're seeing it quite a bit in, in Montana with certain companies. Of course, if you do that, you better have a pretty good variety because uh, there is added seed cost if, if uh, you're buying your seed each year for a low value crop like winter wheat or spring wheat. And then, then we have, we're kind of the opposite example in as public institution, we, we release public varieties. They're, they're, uh, they're PVP'd and Title V, they're protected. We, we own those varieties, but we release them as public varieties. And producers have the option of, of keeping their own seed. The farmer saves seed is uh, allowed to be replanted as long as that producer wants to on, on these uh, crops. So, so it's a choice by uh, whoever's marketing the varieties. And uh, if we are dealing with coaxium or Clearfield from the public program, we're not allowed to release those publicly because uh, we have to, the company owning the technology within those varieties has to be compensated for their technology. So we license those varieties that, uh, that we have to, and uh, we publicly release, you know, the most of our, our wheat varieties. And is that true across the board for all varieties at MSU, uh, all plant crops? Yeah, they they would all be they all would have the same concept applied to them. Um, usually, like Phil says, when there's a special or a unique trait, uh, there can be more creative uh, agreements or release processes put in place. But uh, for the most part. Uh, their, their public releases and um, handled much the same way. Is that true for you too, Jamie? Yeah, I'd say that the only kind of exception may be um, malt barley where you usually grow that under a contract and whoever you're contracting with may require you to get the seed, you know, new seed or make sure that it, it may not want you to replant it, uh, but depending on the contract, yeah. But, but for the most part, uh, most of the barley lines released in the last, oh, I don't know, 20, 30 years have all been public. There's a couple of exceptions. What about the breeding lines that you have uh, to get there? Do you, do you sell those or do you trade those? What do you... Um... So, so like if you think about all the... So for example, if you think about it, we make more than a hundred crosses every year. Um, each one of those crosses ends up equaling a hundred to 200 lines. Um, you know, almost all of that doesn't make it. You know, we, we're lucky if we release a single line a year. Um, so there's a lot of material there um, that if it has something really good about it, then can be incorporated back into the breeding program we build on the germplasm. So say, say we've got a line that we like something about it, but it's not quite right. Then we can make another cross with it. And, and we just keep on moving forward inch by inch by building on that germplasm. So it, it doesn't really go to waste. Um, for the most part, other people maybe don't necessarily want it. Um, there's been a few exceptions to that where we've had a sister line um, maybe licensed to a company or, or something like that. So there has been a couple of exceptions, but, but for the most part, um, that material just gets incorporated back into the breeding program. And, you know, every cross we make is a little experiment. And so we learn something about the genetic control. We learn something about the traits we care about. 
with every cross we make. And so that knowledge is there in the data that we create. And, and so every single one of those crosses, I think, helps move us forward. And the fun thing for me, as far as the way my program works, is um, every single one of those lines has the potential of becoming a research project for a student. Like if we see something interesting happening, then that can then go into um, a research project so we can learn more about the genetics. And we're finding that, especially with the malt, um, there hasn't been a lot of studies of the genetic control of malt quality. And so we've been making a lot of crosses with some old material that uh, people, uh, a lot of the maltsters and brewers, especially the, in the craft side, say they like the older varieties. And so we're looking at those older varieties and crossing them, for example, with buzz and trying to figure out what's the difference between those. So those are all fun studies um, that will add to our knowledge and hopefully eventually be able to be incorporated into a line. So I'll, I'll add a little bit as far as the, the germplasm and exchanges that, um, that I've benefited from as well as in, intend to participate in. So uh, some of these pure lines, the ones that Jamie referred to as not being quite up to, up to par, up to snuff uh, with regard to release, still have redeeming characteristics. Uh, and can be valuable in other crosses or maybe in a different region. Uh, when I came here to MSU, uh, benefited from uh, material uh, shared from NDSU that I'd worked on there, uh, some of the true breeding and pure lines uh, of each of the three crops uh, through a, a material transfer agreement, uh, received that material and, and then able to make crosses, test and evaluate it here uh, and, and use it in the breeding program. Uh, intend to reciproc reciprocate that back to NDSU, uh, ideally this fall, especially with the peas. Uh, those sorts of exchanges are very fruitful, uh, can be very valuable to a breeding program uh, in sharing germplasm, different genetic combinations, uh, and uh, just mixing the characteristics and traits that we're interested in, uh, being able to select what we're after. So that's, that's another side of, of germplasm exchange and use of some of these uh, these breeding lines that we do develop, even if they don't make a variety. This, I, this Phil Bruckner again, uh, as, as my career has developed in, in recent years, we've been more interested in licensing opportunities with, with lines that uh, have, we don't think have potential in Montana because we've released what we think is the best variety for Montana as a public variety. There's, there's other people that are interested in some of our, our lines that we're not gonna release. I would mention we, re, we licensed uh, a sister line forage winter wheat uh, a year or two ago. We released Ray winter wheat in Montana. And this other one was related, but a little bit different. And uh, it was licensed for use outside of Montana to, to two different companies in, in, one was in Utah and one was in uh, South Dakota. And uh, we're anticipating that there will be some royalties that will come back and contribute uh, some funding to the breeding project in the future. And uh, in addition to that, in we, re we have licensed the Clearfield lines that we already talked about, but we've also licensed a couple hard white uh, winter wheat lines that haven't really worked as commodity wheats in Montana. So uh, we are, I guess, in the process of, of licensing a line to a company, a hard white line that uh, this company has connections with a Japanese company that's interested in that particular line, hard white line, and has unique end use quality. So that's the kind of lines that get uh, licensed in Montana. Of course, we're, if somebody would utilize them in Montana, we wouldn't be looking for, for licensing opportunities elsewhere. 
So there's mention of grasshoppers. Um, and I think probably Eastern Montana may be worse than the rest, but I sure see them a lot. And I'm right here in central Montana. And, um, and uh, I bet they are, I, I have a lot of, cause I'm in, in Judith Basin. So I have a lot of regrowth and they're chewing down on that. But in Eastern Montana, they're waiting for those farmers to get that winter wheat in the ground so they can have something to eat. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> so, um, you know, with COVID, are you guys uh, running into any uh, struggles for getting students or, or help to, to get your research done and move forward? Well, I'll take a first step. I'll take a first step at that question. Um, I guess when it, when it first hit, uh, it was pretty nervous as far as being able to get things uh, prepared for the spring and get them planted. Um, with the way that the way that the whole situation was managed and uh, the care that was taken and the plans put in place, uh, I, I guess I feel quite fortunate that we were able to continue uh, to move forward with, a, with specific plans of how to manage uh, the situation. Uh, successfully planted everything, and as, as as time has gone on, things have, I guess, maybe come under control or or um, understood a little bit better. Maybe. Uh, we've been able to continue. Uh, so as far as the Pulse program, uh, we've been able to, to handle or to move forward uh, at 100% of what we were going to do. Uh, some of my colleagues have not been that fortunate. Uh, they've been uh, cut back, you know, maybe 25%, so that's 75% of their normal capacity. Uh, but as far as the Pulse program, I uh, feel fortunate to be where we are. One thing I will mention is our system, the university system, is currently under a hiring freeze, which impacts mm. our breeding program significantly in that Luther Talbert retired at the end of December last year, this long-term spring wheat breeder. So we are unable to hire a uh, tenure track spring wheat breeder under the current uh, rules, and that's way above my pay grade for deciding about hires. But uh, with breeding programs, we've all talked about how we have these cycles going, these long-term cycles. So we can't really afford to have no plant breeders in certain positions. Of course, we have competent professionals still working in the spring wheat breeding program. And going through the steps, but we don't have the leader of that program. Progr programmatically, I'm in charge of that program, but in reality, I don't have extra time to do the spring wheat uh, leadership in addition to the, the winter wheat program. So I'd say that's an issue. That's a direct uh, result of, of the virus. And uh, we are trying to uh, do temporary things, maybe hire, you know, uh, more help for the spring wheat breeding program. We're in the middle of a, a search right now where we're going to hire a, a uh, research assistant spring wheat breeder. It's going to be a PhD level person and, and we have lots of good candidates that have applied for this position. But uh, we need to uh, eventually get back on track in terms of filling vacant positions. And that, in, that includes the endowed chair too. I would say um, one of the, you know, we lost student labor in the spring, which just meant that we um, full-time people had to take on more of that work. And then the start of the semester early impacted us a little bit as far as our, our um, undergraduate help because uh, they went back to school, but um, I've got graduate students that have been picking up the slack for me. A big impact across the country, I think, is the fact that granting agencies have been impacted. Um, so, you know, our, our long-term fiscal support, um, you know, we lost money from in my program because the Brewers Association, who normally uh, gives us oh, $50,000 a year, was unable to this year, things like that. But then also, even as big as USDA, the funding process is slowed down there. Um, so that's an issue. 
Uh, we get data from USDARS. Um, the MALT lab, USDARS, is totally shut down. The genotyping labs have been slowed down uh, because of COVID closures. So there's issues there that have slowed us down a little bit. I'm lucky that we developed our own MALT lab. So we're able, we're gonna be able to move through our breeding material from this fall um, and get the data that we need to move forward. So uh, we may have a little bit less data to work with, but uh, we should be able to advance at the same rate, um, just sort of uh, making ends meet essentially. Um, so anyway, there are some effects, I think, but we've been able to manage through them. Yeah. You know, there was, uh, uh, I think, funding from the legislature through bonding for grow centers at the research stations. Um, I assume this will benefit you. Is that going forward? I assume it's going forward. I think that that is more, uh, so that uh, funding was really important to support the researchers at the station's um, research. So, you know, we have, um, there's individual researchers at every station. I think most stations have at least two faculty members. And, um, and so that, that greenhouse, those greenhouse spaces were important. Um, our greenhouse spaces that we use for our early generation stuff is our in Bozeman, our plant growth center. Um, and I think that that's true of all three of us. But that, yeah, I, I, I think that those projects are going forward, but we'd have to get the station people on to be able to answer that directly. So uh, I, I'm, I did get I'm to visit a... all the stations this year and, and, you know, they've had issues as far as uh, with COVID, um, hard to keep um, employees, you know, they've had to try to keep growing. They grow all of our trials for us, and they've had to try to do that with maybe fewer numbers. And so we really do appreciate the center's continued efforts to give us our breeding data so that we weren't slowed down. So a lot of our ability to move forward is dependent on their, that data that they've, they've been able to give us through this difficult time. Yep, I, I, I second that as well very very grateful for their their support and third so I, i'm a i'm an agronomy uh, uh, graduate from montana state university and i'm a i'm a conventional farmer um and um but i have a lot of friends that are organic growers mm -hmm. and um and they're um and organic agriculture i think if you if you look at it commodity price wise is one of the few sectors that is doing well and uh, and the acres are expanding uh, quite a bit of because of that and i just want your thoughts if you, if you guys are thinking or working on developing varieties that are probably more efficient not at, at making more nitrogen work but making less from making more from less nitrogen or such things just curious what you have on on your plate in that respect. Well, one of the really cool things is that Pat Carr is converting uh, that Central Ag Research Center uh, to organic. And we have had some trials there. It's, it, I guess I'm naive and I was incredibly surprised the difference in the rank order. Uh, we just put our regular trial there and it was an upside down data set where you know everything seemed opposite of what it did in conventional so i recognize that we need it i think the problem is enough data so i think our only hope is if we could find a way to collaborate with growers uh, to put some of our trials on uh, their organic fields where and then the other issue too is that there's so many different ways a variation in managing um, the organic systems that I think would impact the variety. So I think, you know, tailoring varieties is going to become more and more necessary if that's if that's the direction we need to go. So it's a real interesting problem. It's I think it's very complicated, 
And, uh, but we're certainly willing to work on it. I, I'd say we're just short on places to put trials where we can get back good data. This year I took notes on how quickly we got ground cover because I think for barley, especially with the forage material, that could really help um, get rid of some weed problems. <clears throat> so anyway, we're thinking about it, but probably not as effectively as we need to. And we probably need to build some collaborations to really be more effective. So I'm kind Sounds of- Sounds like you're giving me some homework there. <laughs> yeah, find me some growers that could help us with that. Uh, we've got material to test. Be it careful, I'll find them for you. Oh, yeah. we'll, that would be great. I'm kind of in the same boat there. I've, uh, in the crosses and the selections, more so in the selections that I've been making, I've been keeping the organic uh, industry in mind. Uh, I, certainly in the organic systems, having a legume crop for the nitrogen fixation benefit uh, to those systems is important, but some of the uh, disease and insect challenges uh, that are there uh, sometimes are, are, um, are not very conducive to, to maintain them in, maintaining them in the system. Uh, the other issue, uh, Jamie mentioned the weed control. Uh, pulse crops are, are sometimes well known for, especially lentils, for not being very competitive. With the peas uh, that I've been making selections, uh, I've been keeping in some of the normal leaf type, uh, selecting some that are more stiff stem so that they uh, maintain lodging resistance. But with those leaves uh, still on the plant, rather than the tendrils of the conventional uh, varieties of, of, of the current production, uh, you get better uh, ground cover to begin with. Uh, so I've been keeping that in mind, trying to come up with lines that we could select and, and uh, test in organic systems, uh, organic uh, fields uh, for, the, for how well they'll perform. But like Jamie said, we need to find places that we can do that. Um, I may be a year out from having uh, adequate numbers and uh, amounts of material to be able to do those tests, uh, but it certainly is on my mind. Uh, it, it's important. It's a very uh, key component of um, of Montana agriculture and uh, in North Dakota as well. So. I will just mention that uh, one thing that we try to do with releasing varieties in at least the winter wheat program is is have a diversity, diverse cultivars within are released uh, set that are available for different types of producers, of course, different environments. And I would consider an organic environment to be a different environment than a lot of the conventional, more conventional environments. Of course, our herbicide resistant wheats are not gonna fit there, but we have lots of others uh, that could be evaluated. Like Jamie says, as long as the ones we want are in the set, if we put them in a different environment, uh, it doesn't matter if it flip flops, as long as we have the ones we want still in the set and we can identify it, those that uh, might be interested, interesting from an organic standpoint by uh, testing in the right environment, so. Yeah. And I, I think, when you talked about the hiring freeze, you probably already answered my next question, but you know, Montana was last year, the largest hemp growing state in the United States. And, uh, and we've planted a lot less acres this year, uh, but we still had 11, 12,000 acres, I believe planted. Uh, is there any thoughts about doing a hemp plant breeding program? Uh, because, you know, one of the requirements is it has been planting certified seed, which is nearly impossible to do. I would have no knowledge of, uh, you know, I would say with, it seems like a stretch to me just being a member of the department. And we're all really stretched just to uh, cover the, the mainline crops. And uh, there's always funding issues and, you know, so of course, just like hiring, that's way above my, uh, my pay grade. So, but it just seems like 
something that's not likely to happen unless there's a big push for it and support for that type of uh, initiative. I think just like the growers pushed to maintain the barley breeding program, just like the growers pushed to bring on the pulse breeding program, I think that the growers have a lot of power to help, um, you know, recognize new important areas. I think that it would have to be a whole new faculty line, uh, which right now with the economic situation doesn't seem very feasible, but you know, things are gonna get better. And so it's just something I think to, uh, you know, the growers need to, if they need it, if they think it's important, um, if the revenue's there, maybe somehow to support it, then, then it can happen. But, I, you know, universities, you know, maybe takes, you know, maybe it'll be a five-year plan or something like that. I don't know. Well, I don't have any more questions in the chat box. And so uh, I guess we'll wrap this up. I was pretty excited about this webinar. And, and let me tell you, you did not disappoint me. Thank you very much. I learned quite a bit. And, um, and uh, good luck uh, with, your, with your breeding programs uh, because it definitely benefits the Montana Family Farm. Uh, thank you and, and, um, and, and have a good day. Well, thanks for having us. We appreciate it.